So thank you, everyone. Tonight's topic is why regression can do you harm. We're talking age regression tonight. Obviously, the first thing is I need to introduce who I am. My name is Gordon Young. I'm the director of the Institute of Applied Psychology. Some of you watching might know me. Others obviously don't. I've been in the field for about 15 years now. I've led two of the associations. I've been the president of the Australian Society of Clinical Hypotherapists, and I've also been the chair of the Australian Board of Neurolinguistic Programming. I've been the editor of the only peer-reviewed journal in the field in Australia. I am a published author. And probably the biggest point of difference between myself and most people in Australia, most trainers in Australia, is that I trained with the Milton H. Erickson Foundation of Phoenix, Arizona, uh, considered by many to be the pinnacle of hypnosis training in the world and, in fact, the birthplace of neurolinguistic programming. I have since participated in international conferences that this organisation has sponsored as a faculty member rather than a student. And the little thing in red there, the 100 Leaders Program, refers to a leadership program, I'm told the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, where they did a study of leadership and they looked at 100 different professions and sought out uh, the person that was deemed to be the leader in that field and interviewed them about how they work and how they, their views of leadership and in this field, I was the one chosen. That is an app that you can actually download. So that's a little bit about me. So we are also the ones who wrote the book. We teach something called strategic psychotherapy. So in our hypnosis training, we teach this unique form of psychotherapy that goes very well with hypnotic vehicle. So hypnosis isn't really a therapy in and of itself. Taking someone into trance doesn't, doesn't necessarily do anything. It relaxes them. But apart from that, relaxing people doesn't really do that much. It might be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. And so there's a particular thought form of therapy that I brought back in from overseas. And there wasn't much written on it. I've developed it. And in conjunction with Dr. William Herfel, who is a uh, philosophy of sciences uh, lecturer at Newcastle University, he's co-authored this book. And this is the textbook for this course. Uh, strategic psychotherapy is what you do when you get them into trance. So hypnosis is the vehicle for delivering strategic psychotherapy. So what is age regression? Now that we've established who we are, what is age regression? Well, technically, it's taking clients back into their past. If I ask you what you did this morning for breakfast, technically, that's age regression. But in reality, it generally refers to this idea of going back and looking for a repressed memory that might explain existing issues or it might go be past life regression work. There's, there's these things are very popular in hypnosis. Uh, I don't get it much anymore, but I certainly used to get it where people would ring up and say, can you take me back through my past? I think there's something going on for me. There must have been saying I can't remember. And if I can remember that, then I'll be okay. Right? This is a very common theory. The basic premise is that one event causes the trauma or creates a debilitating pattern of thought or behaviour in some way. So it's referred to as a linear causal model. A linear causal model is that there's a direct link, there's a cause and effect. If, and, and that kind of works in, in physics well enough. If I hit myself on the shoulder, then I cause myself some grief here, some pain here, it's a clear indicator that you know, the strike caused the pain. This is a little bit harder to, to negotiate when it comes to mental processes. So 
the linear causal model has been really, really strong in psychotherapy for about 100 years. As I said, very popular right until about the 1980s. Age regression was probably the most common thing a therapist would do with someone. Freud was all about going to the past. And when you think about it, about it, it totally makes sense. If you can't work out what's going on for you, where could it have emerged? Well, your past is the obvious place that it started, somewhere in your childhood. And, and it, so it makes sense to go looking for it if you don't have other mechanisms. Now, have your problems, whatever they are, and your patterns of behaviour, have they been created in the past? Of course. Where else could they have been created? But going back looking for them presupposes a bunch of things that I don't necessarily agree with. So let me give you a bit of a background so that I'm clear about my biases, because that's what's most important. That I'm clear and upfront about my view before I tell you anything else. So my original training was in therapies that took you back into your childhood regularly to go and review and access. And I also did past life regression work. I trained with the Michael Newton Foundation out of New York, probably arguably the most famous um, past life regression school in the world. And I had a very interesting experience. There was 26 of us and there were times when there might be four or six of us left in the room because we'd go off and do an exercise and most people were so traumatized by that exercise that they had to go home. Most of them discovered that they had some terrible deaths in previous lives. Uh, they came back the next day, still often quite traumatized. And I was greatly concerned by this. There were a number of stories that came out of that. There was one woman who claimed that in the hypnosis, she went back to the year 1200. She knew it was the year 1200 for very specific reasons. I can't quite remember exactly what they were. But her current husband had been her husband back in 1200 and he had strangled her with piano wire. Now, most people in the room saw a very clear causal link as to why she's got issues with her husband now, as you might. This made perfect sense to most people in the room and the story grew about how clear this was because she was so emotional about the story, it had to be real. And I'm, I'm a former history teacher. Pianos weren't invented until the 1700s. So she's out by about 500 years. And even if we kind of go back to the harpsichord, which is like a, a precursor to uh, pianos, again, they didn't have the technology to make piano wire anything close to 1200. So I was sitting back thinking, okay, everyone's buying into this, but I'm really struggling here with the details. And they, they were a number of brothers. I worked with a guy who in his past life had been a prisoner of the Japanese during World War II and he had always had a hatred for the Japanese. Now he knew why. He was, a, he was treated horribly, he was tortured, he was a prisoner of the Japanese. When I asked him how old he was now, Doing a little bit of math, I recognised that he was probably about two or three years old when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbour. So he was here in this lifetime. So that would have been hard for him to be there in a previous lifetime. So 1941, he was over, he was 70-something years old. He was already here. And I remember being at the back of the room and I was sitting there and I must have been, I had my arms folded, most because I was comfortable. And the two trainers came up to me and said, I'm not sure you're completely with us. 
I said, well, do you want me to tell you the truth or you know, do you want just reinforcement? And they said, tell me the truth. I said, well, I'm a little bit concerned that most of what's happening here is just all fabrication. And to my surprise, they both said, you're absolutely right. Most of this is bullshit. These guys are just making stuff up. And I thought, okay, that's not what I expected. And they were very concerned about the quality of some of the therapists that were in the room. And so these guys actually seem quite scientific in many ways. I've since been to New York on a couple of occasions and always caught up with them whilst there. But my concern was, one, you never know what you're going to get when you take people down this pathway. And number two, any time you go back in the past, it needs to come to a resolution. If the door's left open and trauma and people get traumatised, I'm wondering about whether that's a really useful way of dealing with, with people. And especially if you're going to be paid to do so, you're very responsible for that client. If that client, you know, is so, um, so upset and so challenged that they step out in front of a car and they, and they end up in a wheelchair, that's not what we want, you know? And I'm not saying that I don't believe in past life. Hear me well. I don't really know what I believe. All I know that, that is that beliefs can neither be proven or disproven. You know, I've got people in my family who are very much into past life. And they do past life regression work. And they think they are resolved in many, many ways. I watch them and I'm not really seeing too many patterns change too much over the years. But it's very much long-term therapy because you can just keep going. There's always another lifetime you can go to. So it's an endless process, it seems to me. You know, I've also worked with a guy called Dr. Peter Ramster, he referred to um, past life work. He, he did a lot of research on it. And, you know, he's on YouTube if you want to see it. He took film crews to the UK and to Europe where he took people living in Australia in this lifetime back to places that he had found that they had they'd come up with whilst in trance, in the hypnotic trance. And they'd never been to Europe before, so there was no way they could really... Uh, you know, testify to what was in that village or anything else. And it's a very interesting thing how sometimes people, they could say, round the corner, there's a staircase and we got to go down the staircase and it leads down to the river. And they've gone, they've turned the corner in a village that none of them have ever been to before and there, lo and behold, is the staircase. So there's some very, it's an interesting space, but therapy isn't a place for your interest. Therapy is to help people get much more functional. So whether you believe in past life or not doesn't necessarily make it a good therapeutic intervention, I suppose is what I'm really saying here. And, one, and hence there's a number of reasons, but I do not teach age regression in our courses. Absolutely not. Here's why. I know other schools do. There's visiting uh, women from the UK who are doing age regression stuff. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people who do age regression stuff, but I won't do it. And here's why. I want you to hear me out. Ten reasons. The first one is it always assumed that there was a direct and simple causal link for every issue. My dad said, you know, I'm, I'm overweight because my dad said this to me when I was eight. Well, your dad said lots of things to you. Why is this one so important? You know, you ignored your father and all sorts of other things. Why did you pay attention to this? And what I think happens is when we can't work out why we do what we do, our brain, our logical brain, conscious mind, goes back in the past, because where else can it go, on an archaeological dig to try and work out why am I like this and looks for something called salience. Salience is anything that kind of seems to link in together. It's the same thing you have when you... Uh, when you have synergy, you know, you're thinking about someone and then they call. So the two bits of information come together. But there's times when you weren't thinking about someone and they called, and there's times when you thought about someone and they didn't call, and there's times when you didn't think about someone and they didn't call. 
All those things are true. You only notice when the two bits of information come together. It's also assumed that the explanation equates to a resolution. That if you explain a situation, it resolves the situation. Well, sometimes. You know, the truth is there's over 400 different types of therapy and every one of them has their devotees. So people do get outcomes no matter what. And here's a problem for you. If during therapy, a woman kind of comes up to the idea that she has poor relationships with men because she had an absent father. And now she remembers this. Here's my question. How does that help? What changes anything with that? Ultimately, the absenteeism of the father doesn't change it. If that, let's say it's true. Let's give it to them. It's true. Now what are you going to do? The truth is there's a skills gap. You don't know how to run a good relationship. Maybe you don't know how to pick a good partner in the first place. So that skills gap is the real issue, and that's happening right here and right now. Here's a thought for you. Your past and your future don't exist anywhere in the real world. Right here, right now, the breath you're taking, this moment is your life. But your past doesn't exist. You can't change what you had for breakfast. So every time you go back into your past and drench something back up, you bring it back into your present. It's not your past that is worrying you, it's the present. So if you keep bringing back things that are 10 years old or more, old traumas, old annoyances and frustrations, it's only a problem because you're, you're activating them in the present moment. My suggestion is stop doing that. You know, it's over. It's a memory. It's just a collection of thoughts you've got in your head now. It's also assumed that all memories in hypnosis are accurate. Now, that's been debunked. When I was first taught hypnosis, they were still teaching that. But the research is pretty clear. There is a real danger of false memory. If you do, if you try to dredge up a memory that they can't access normally when they walk through your door, and you do it through age regression, there is a danger you could implant a memory that isn't real. When I first came into hypnosis, we were paying something like $1,500 a year for insurance because the insurance companies were so worried about false memories that people would accidentally put in memories and thoughts that the client would then think was true. And there were so many families destroyed by this. You know, clients would go home to their father and, and, and accuse him of molestation when nothing had happened or broken up the family of these sorts of things. So there was a real danger there of that. And we've managed to get the insurance right down to about $200, but they do not, the insurance companies do not like you doing age regression work. In fact, they pretty well won't support you if you do that. Yeah. Here's the example. There's something, a famous study called Lost in the Mall. Just, I'll just give you a couple of minutes of it. In her challenge to the idea of repressed memory, Elizabeth Loftus set out to demonstrate experimentally how false memories could be implanted in some people. This came to be known as the Lost in the Mall technique from the first study that involved trying to plant false childhood memories in 24 participants. We contacted their mother or their father or an older relative of theirs. And then we went back to the subject and we said, we've been talking with your mother. Uh, we found out some things that happened to you when you were about five or six years old. And we'd like to see what you can remember about these experiences that your mother told us about. Participants were given three true experiences and a false one that involved being lost in a shopping mall as a six-year-old. Your mother told us that you were shopping at the, at the corner uh, shopping mall on a Saturday one, one time, and you were by the pet store, and all of a sudden you disappeared, and you were gone for the longest period of time. 
And eventually we found you, you were crying and an elderly woman had uh, rescued you and brought you back to the, the main office. Do you remember that experience? The researchers were able to plant false memories in 25% of their participants, a statistically significant figure. And what surprised them was the rich detail of these false memories. They would start telling us things, uh, details about the, the appearance of the person who rescued them, other, other kinds of details that, uh, that we had never mentioned to them. So, so that showed that they were putting a lot of sensory detail uh, onto this created memory. So this study, very famous study, started to challenge this idea of repressed memory, the idea that we, we, we shut it down in order to survive. And the way memory works, it's reconstructive, it's not reproductive. There is the lead up to an event, the event and the aftermath of every event. The likelihood of you not being able to remember systemic abuse, for instance, is virtually nil. There's enough, if there would be enough exposure to it, it would be very hard not to. You might become more dissociated as a result and not relate to people, of course. But the likelihood of you being completely blank on something major like that would be very, very small. And yet it was actually, there are some people who just, you know, they, you could go in, and this is true even here sitting in, sitting in Australia right now. There was one particular woman, when I see her clients, as I often do, they might go in for fear of public speaking because they've got to present to a, a board or something, and they come out with a child abuse history that they can't remember. This is dangerous stuff. And the irony is they say, well, the fact you can't remember it means it must be worse than we thought. It must be even more extensive. Otherwise, why would you not remember it? Now, that's a double bind. It makes no sense. The fourth one is it just has a really poor success rate. If you look at the evidence, anything where you keep going back into the past and getting involved in people's stories actually has a really poor success rate compared to modern forms of psychotherapy, which are all process-driven. They're more about the pattern of thinking and the pattern of behaving that you're running. So the fact it has a poor success rate is another major factor as to why you might want to not go down that pathway. Because I get that you might be interested in it and you might find it fascinating, but your clients aren't paying you money for you to indulge in your fascination. Your clients are paying you money to get a result. For me, if I can't get a result virtually every time, assuming you have turned up for all your, meet your sessions and you've done all the homework and you've done everything I have to do, there should be virtually no reason why you shouldn't get an outcome. There should be virtually no example of that. In fact, if you come to, my, to a second session with me and you say nothing's changed, I know something's, something's wrong with that. That can't be. Either you haven't done your homework, which I've often is listened to the recording of the session, or you told me something that wasn't really accurate. So it could be that you said you're just really stressed all the time, but in actual fact, you're really angry. And so that's a whole, slightly different angle or something else, something else has happened. But there's no way you should turn up for a second session unchanged if we've done our job from the model that I would come from. There is also the dangers of ab reaction and re-traumatizing someone. So if someone has had an awful past, the danger of you taking them into it in hypnosis is they can do something called revivification. Revivific revivification isn't easy to say, but revivification is where they almost, they, they're back there and they're living it. And an ab reaction is a really, really extreme emotional response. So I've only seen it twice in my life and I've seen over 4,000 people in the, in the clinical realm. It's frightening. You know, they will be crying uncontrollably, screaming like they're being attacked. It's something that you have to accept as part of the deal if you're going to take people back looking for their trauma. 
Now, I've only, paid, I've only sued it twice, and I didn't take them back. I just happened, the moment they got hypnotized, they started to go into this other space. Most of my students, or my graduates, I should say, have never reported to me that I've ever seen that reaction because we just don't work that way. But if you were to do past life regression or age regression, you would see it regularly. And I'm going to say, I mean, it's uncontrolled, shaking, crying, screaming, uh, loud enough that people would probably be coming to your door if you're in a building, wondering what the hell's going on. It's not pleasant, I've got to tell you. This weak success rate also um, means that it doesn't correlate very well against more effective methods. But I'm going to say clients deserve the most advanced and successful techniques available. As I said before, clients aren't there to entertain your fascination with something. You are, your responsibility is to get them an outcome the best way you can, and that should come with techniques that you know and can validate. And now the associations have, have basically determined that this should not be done. Age regression work should be avoided. It is inadvisable. Insurance companies will typically not cover you if you go looking for a memory that cannot be accessed in the here and now by the client before you did the session. So if you go against the association guidelines, their, their ethics, they will not support you and the insurance companies won't support you. That's a problem. If someone decides that since going back and discovering some horrible thing about themselves through your hypnosis. It's meant that they haven't been out of sleep ever since. They've lost their job. Uh, they're traumatized. They're suicidal. And they decide to sue you. You have no backup because you went against the ethics of the association and the insurance will very happily dump you as well. So it's just not worth it. So my perspective is I'm going to teach you techniques that you can back. There's evidence for them. You can, you can sit in a courtroom and explain why you did what you did. Because I can tell you now, if, if you end up in court, and I'm, no one's ever had, it's never happened to anyone in Australia so far. But if you're in court and you... And a barrister asks you why you chose to use past life regression or you chose to go back looking for a memory that hadn't been uh, exposed prior, knowing that the literature tells you not to, knowing that the, all the guidelines say it's, it, it doesn't work or that it's dangerous, what are you going to say? Here's the thing. They will tear you to ribbons you will be their best entertainment they've had in a year because they will pull you apart. You will not win that one because you haven't got a leg to stand on. You've gone for something that is actually proven to have very poor outcome. So here's the other thing. It doesn't satisfy my definition of therapy. It may be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. Yoga is therapeutic. Gardening can be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. For me, therapy is you're changing perspectives, you're, change, you're upskilling the client. You're helping them learn how to do something different. I think some people, and I, I've had all this stuff done to me too, some people feel better after these sessions because what it does is actually negate the uncertainty you had around the problem. So if you can't work out why you, you're teary around certain things and you get a story and explanation, it gives you a because. It's like, oh, that's why. And so there's a relief of tension in that. It's an aha moment. So it seems like it's useful. But the truth is it doesn't stop you doing it next time. It doesn't stop you, doesn't develop a new skill set around that. It doesn't help you change. Help, you know, what, are the, what is therapy about? You have to define it for yourself. Why are you going to be involved if you're not yet? 
Why would you like to be involved? And if you are, why are you involved now? It's about helping other people, but the starting point of that is do no harm. That includes playing with things that you're not really across or testing things out. I think if you're going to go down these lines, you need to be really, really good as a therapist because this age regression stuff, let's assume you ignore all my warnings. This age regression stuff, it can go pear-shaped so quickly. You know, I've watched it in some of the courses I've done. I've seen it with some of the therapists I know. It can go pear-shaped so quickly and you can get stuck. I've heard in supervision sessions with people and the person's been traumatised. And then I've had it in my own clinic where I've had to undo this, where people have come from other therapists. The first thing I pointed out to them was that none of this is real. Right here, right now, you're in my office. And we can't guarantee anything, any of that was real. So let's just look at what, what's, what's actually happening here. The other thing I would say is that therapy is about learning new skills. If you can't trust people, the reason why you can't trust people is that you don't trust yourself to make a distinction between the people you can trust and the people you can't if that makes sense. Because you can't trust everyone, but you can't trust no one either. The idea that no one's untrust, no one's trustworthy makes no sense. But if you can't work out who's who, the only sensible thing you can do is to trust no one. Now that makes sense, you globalize. You make the assumption because that's gonna be safer than trusting and then paying the price. But the problem is a skills gap. You lack distinction. You are not discerning enough. You don't trust your own criteria to work out who can be trusted and who can't. That has nothing to do with your past. Actually, let me pull that back. Yes, you didn't learn the skills from the past. So whatever happened in your past, it's left you with a skills gap. So I will say to clients who really think that we've got to go back in the past and really deal with something and all that stuff, okay, at the end of the day, we can't change any of that. Unchangeable. But the gap in your skill set that's operating right now, that we can plug. That's what we're going to go after. Because all that happened to you as a child, and we'll talk about memories that they can remember, that was a terrible thing. It should never have happened. And that's what I'll tend to do with Pete when I go to the past. I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll validate it. I will help normalize it. I'll point out that as a child, you didn't have any say in it, so let's park any idea that you were complicit in it. Ultimately, you did learn these basic skills about who you can trust. That's what we're gonna work on. And the other thing is, a lot of time people go into this past life stuff or age regression stuff, and they like it because it gives them an out. It gives them a reason. It gives them a, okay, I'm not to blame. It's not my fault. And when you won't take responsibility for your behaviour and your actions and your thoughts, it also means you don't have power. My job is not to blame anyone. My job is to help you get back control of your life. So even in hypnotherapy, that sounds like, it, you know, people don't know much about it, sounds like it's about me controlling them. The truth is my whole aim is to help them get control of themselves. Because if I don't help you understand a basic premise that you're in control of your own thoughts and feelings, then you'll never have a happy life. Because here's the thing, here's the pivot point of your life. We all have negative thoughts. We all have aggressive thoughts. We all have you know, um, you know, embarrassing thoughts. The question is, do you listen to them or not? The difference between people who are stuck are the ones, they, they tend to listen to all these thoughts and feelings. The ones who aren't just don't give them airtime. The pivot point of your life comes down to which thoughts and feelings do you pay attention to and which ones do you tend to ignore. That's it. And that is a skill. If you can't have thoughts and feelings and ignore them, then you have a lack of compartmentalization skill. And that is problematic. The, the, that is intrinsic 
in all anxiety-based concerns and all depression, all addiction as well. You can't say no, even though every you know, good chunk of you knows you should, you can't do it. So it's really crucial to develop these skills in people because you're not just trying to undo one thing, you're trying to give them a new and better life. You know, sometimes you have to reparent them in many ways. So what are the seven deadlies in this? Well, as I said, coming back to our example before, if you have poor relationships with men, it's not because your dad left when you were, when you were 13. You might have really poor search criteria or you might be really rubbish at managing a relationship. I have to find out from you. What is your criteria when you're choosing a partner? Is it that he's cute? Because if that's it, there's a lot of other elements that really need to be in that criteria. The most common one is how he makes me feel. I'm using the female exam because that's why I see come from my door so often. But how he makes you feel doesn't actually speak about him. It speaks about you. You might tend to use your emotions too much as an indicator of action. So this, is the, this comes back to the same thing. Oh, he makes me feel this way. He's the one. But, you know, he doesn't have a job and he's, he has no friends or his friends are deadbeats or whatever else it is. You have to ignore all that and you go with your feelings. You probably run a level of conflict aversion or poor boundary setting in order to keep coming up with poor relationships with men. If you're conflict adverse, then it's very hard for you to set a boundary or to pull people up on something. You'll also tend to run something called an avoidant coping style. That is to say, if there's a problem here in front of you, you want to look that way. You don't deal with it. That way things start to slide. You know that there's some red flags you've just seen and you don't pay attention to them the way you should have. I can't tell you how many women have got trapped in a really unpleasant, abusive relationship. And when I ask them, are you telling me there were no signs of this? The answer is always, yes, there were, but they ignored them. They wanted it to be true when it wasn't. They have an unrealistic self-assessment. That means you don't know how to assess yourself realistically. Typically, most women will underestimate themselves. As a general rule, men can overestimate themselves a fair bit. So when you can't work out where you fit in the system and you can't really objectively assess your skill sets, your, what, what a, a level of confidence should be, then you've got to undershoot and as a result, put up with crap you really shouldn't. Change it, that one. So one of the guiding principles here is the problem is not the event. No matter what happened, the problem is your reaction to what happened. It's not what happened. How you react to it is unique to you. The same thing could have happened to any number of other people, but they didn't react the way you did. So there are exceptions to the rule. I had it in my own family. My mother was a prisoner of war of the Japanese. She was taken on her 12th birthday. My, father, my grandfather was a colonel in the Hong Kong Defence Force, British Army. He died in the, in the siege of Hong Kong. My aunt, who was nine, was also taken. And I remember when I was just a young boy, eight, nine, ten, we used to go and visit my aunt who was living in Queensland. And she, I would hear her, and she would constantly talk about how the war had ruined her life, but she'd never been the same again. And my mother would say to her, why do you keep talking about the war? It's 30 years ago. It's 40 years ago. Let it go. It's, it's a long time ago. It's history. 
And she'd say, well, you, my aunt would say, oh, yeah, but you don't understand. I really, and my mother would go, what do you mean I don't understand? I was there too. Let it go. You survived. Let it go. Jesus, you know. And they would argue backwards and forwards. And, and the idea that my mother didn't understand really riled my mother. And in the end, they stopped talking. They'd been through all that, but they stopped talking for about 20 years. You may not have an exception to it in your life, but what about others? Is that type of event automatically going to create whatever you're, you're doing now? If someone else doesn't, if someone had the same experience or a similar experience and isn't acting the way you are, what are they doing differently? Because there's a clue. There's a resource there that maybe you're not using. So I'm going to say there are two things that trip all of us up. My teacher, Michael Yabko, one of my main ones, probably the most decorated psychologist in the history of, of uh, American Psychological Association. He talks about the experiential gaps. And what that really means is there's two things that trip you up, what you don't know and what you think you don't, what you think you know that isn't so. What you don't know and what you think you know that isn't so. I'm not good enough is an example of what you think you know that isn't so. And what you don't know creates uncertainty. And all anxiety is, is the fear of the unknown. You're never quite worried about what you already know. You're worried about what you don't know. You're worried about what it could be because then you have room to catastrophize and make stuff up in your head. All anxiety is a fear of your own imagination. It's not actually about a fear of what's really going on in front of you because that's even then you're tracking forward in the future. It's not the same thing. So to finish off, Milton Erickson was famously quoted by saying, people do not come to change their past. People come to change their future. If you become a therapist in this space, you become a hypotherapist, People don't care about their past. They care about their future. They want to create a new and compelling future. And you don't do that by going back and dredging through their past endlessly. Everything that happened prior to this moment is done and I cannot change it. The only thing I can do from the past is learn from it and then let it go. And you need to teach your clients how to do that. Constantly entertaining and taking them back through the past is the fastest way to re-traumatise anyone who's had a difficult past with relatively little therapeutic benefit, in my experience. So that's my position on age regression. Please check yourself about things like insurances and whether the association will back you. Even past life regression, I had a conversation with the, the association not long ago because they have run some past life courses. And I asked them, if you won't support someone if they go back looking for a memory that they can't remember, if you won't support the therapist when they do that, how do you support a therapist if they do past life regression? Isn't that going back looking for a memory that they can't remember in the year and now? Of course it is. It's potentially dangerous. If you're attached to doing it, by all means, but I, you have to accept your success, your success rates with people will be relatively low. Now, you might say to me, you know, I had it done and it worked for me. I have no doubt. It's a very common thing that we tend to project. It's called self-referencing. We project what we think is important because we had an experience and for us it seemed to work. It doesn't mean to say it's going to work on most other people. Some people love chocolate ice cream. I don't. That's what it comes down to. Is it right for most people to come through your door? I think you are responsible 
to work your practice around something, a model that is most likely to work for most people. The strategic approach that we teach works for basically everyone who wants to participate. Almost nothing works for people who don't want to participate. But I've not met anyone yet that has had a struggle with a strategic model, which is why we stay with it. And even people who are really big on uh, age regression, by about um, uh, a quarter of the course, they're, they're frequently saying, I don't, yeah, I think I'll let that go because we have a clear alternative. If I didn't have an alternative for you, of course, you've got to do something. Well, there are clear alternatives these days. So I hope that was useful. Talk to us. You can call this number, 1300 380 681.